These thyristor modules are constructed on top of a solid copper block. 800 grams of pure thermal conductivity. I wonder if 250 watts of pure JBC power can solder on there. Come on. Wait a second, is that normal? Oh no, stop, 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 stop. Nah, just kidding. But not about the JPC soldering station. That's finally done after months of delays. Quick recap. At the end of the last video I had a fully working proof of concept that uses standard parts to control a JBC C470 cartridge. But I had a few problems I wanted to address before calling it done. First and foremost, the triac I used wasn't very efficient. Not a deal breaker, but it can be done so much more elegantly. Second, the instrumentation amplifier is not strictly necessary, because one of its inputs will be permanently grounded anyway. I'll explain these two points in a second, and then I'm finally fulfilling the promise I made in the last video. Software and schematics in the description. Then we can wrap this up for good and move on to more exciting things. Ok, let's start by finding a replacement for that triac. I've been thinking about... Ah, oh, what the hell, I've already built something around a pre-made solid state relay. That is a tiny bit more efficient and extremely easy to use. One external component. What I didn't realize at all is that there is a minimum load voltage. But I like the idea of using a solid state relay in here, so I'll make a better one. The VOM1271 photoelectric gate driver is basically an LED and a specialized solar cell that can apply a floating gate source voltage to two in channel MOSFETs. Or just one. When enabled, current can flow in both directions, because one MOSFET is reverse biased and the other one is turned on with a positive gate source voltage. Useful side effects are optical isolation, which will be important in a moment, and the freedom to choose my own very energy efficient MOSFET switches. So what do you think? Which transistor will it be? TO220 probably? Yeah, that would have been my guess too, but no. The MOSFET industry is progressing very fast. By choosing a very new product, I almost automatically get one with a very low on resistance. Which in turn means very little wasted energy in my solid state relay. Usually it's also very important to turn on a MOSFET quickly and make it spend little time in its high resistance linear region. But I think I'll continue to do the switching near the zero crossing, so that even if the MOSFETs aren't fully saturated immediately, only small currents are flowing. I hope it doesn't look too complicated, because it really isn't. Apart from the solid state relay I just explained, there's just a plus and minus 5 volt power supply, a bit of convoluted digital stuff for the push buttons and the LCD, and finally the other big improvement over the last design, a single fairly standard op amp. The instrumentation amplifier I wanted to use last time would have had two major advantages. One, common mode noise rejection. Well, my microcontroller will happily keep a running average, and when it comes to soldering temperature, the total accuracy isn't that critical. Two, low input bias current. Oh, come on, give me a break. A modern JFET input op amp costs a couple of cents and has an input bias current in the single pico amp range too. A thermocouple can easily deliver that. These two separate grounds have caused quite a bit of confusion underneath the last video. And because they kind of found their way into the new design as well, I wanted to take a minute and explain them properly. Ok, picture this. The JBC cartridges consist of a thermocouple, a heater and an outer shell holding them together. The outer shell and one side of the thermocouple are permanently grounded, because best practice. This references the thermocouple voltage to mains earth. And so the whole controller section must also be referenced to mains earth. Which is, you know, very common. But if also the heater supply voltage was referenced to mains earth, there would inevitably be unwanted currents through the thermocouple. So the easiest solution is to use a transformer with two independent output voltages. One is rectified, referenced to mains earth, 
and regulate it down to the needs of the controller. The other one is exclusively for the heater. Its circuit can be controlled with our optically isolated solid state relay. <gasps> Enough theory for now. Let's get back to the real world and finally build that thing. The more I use it, the better I seem to like this very classic transparency based PCB making method. The results are just fantastic, even when it comes to some of the smallest power MOSFET packages there are. For these low volume prototypes, or demonstrators as we have to call them these days, I like to manually tin every exposed copper surface, because that is how it was done in older Fluke gear and that has certainly worked great for them, over the course of decades even. I have also, without expecting anything, tried one of these UV curable solder mask products. I'll give it approximately 5 minutes in the tanning bed. I must have peeled that off the wrong way somehow, but the result was still impressive. I think I'll use that for the front cover. That'll look fantastic. On the topic of front covers, I thought I had the enclosure figured out completely, with the old hi-fi amplifier transformer and a couple of spacers inside a Hammond Universal enclosure. But it just barely didn't fit, missed by a millimeter. So I guess I'm adding another corpse to the graveyard and we'll have to use some of my treasures instead. My hoarding tendencies strongly advised against using one of these extruded heavy-duty aluminium enclosures and instead to keep them for some higher purpose, I guess. But this will be such a beautiful fit, I don't think I can let the hoarding tendencies win this time. Alright, I've relocated everything to a new front panel PCB, which is essentially single-sided. And instead of an Arduino, I'm now using a single Atmega 8 microcontroller. I've tried to use as few through-hole components as possible, and those that were unavoidable will just be surface mounted anyway. So that the only drill holes in the front panel will be for screws, two push buttons and the soldering iron connector. One final cleaning in acetone and we are ready for assembly. Instead of green solder mask, I went with black spray paint for the front panel, because I think that'll look a lot better with the rest of the enclosure. We can agree on that, can't we? I've made two of these silicone rubber bumpers from hardware store silicone. They should be able to absorb any humming from the transformer. Thanks to zero voltage switching and a lot of decoupling rubber, the soldering station should be perfectly silent. I haven't decided yet which connector I'll use for the soldering iron. A gold plated lemo would be spectacular of course, but it isn't such an important connection. So I think this decision can be delayed in favor of the good old hoarding tendencies. Well, and apart from that we are done, finally. Because I'm not using a PID controller at all, I expect a bit of overshoot and sure enough, here it is. But I don't mind that at all. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if many trusted soldering stations had a similar overshoot that they just don't display. This one heats up even more quickly than the last version, because with the new toroidal transformer, the heater gets a little bit more than 250 watts. Well then, let's give it a try. Not with the thyristor module, of course, that would be stupid. 
If I were to heat that up to 300 degrees C, I would have to wait half an hour for it to cool down again, I bet. Have a look at the IS temperature stability. Even without a PID temperature controller, to me that is perfectly satisfying. Gonna save the solid state relay and its stupid minimum load voltage for something else, I guess. Here's another look at the regulation and its performance under the worst conditions. And that's all for today. Thank you for watching and see you next time.